We can often pit God's love and His justice against each other, supposing that they are contrary to one another. But according to the Bible, they fit entirely perfectly together. The God of love is the God who will not ignore and will not tolerate evil, but must deal with it. Welcome to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths. I'm Steve Hiller. Glad you're with us as we continue our series, Looking at Our God. And today, we look at our loving God. Jonathan, I think uh, one of the, the things that you point out there is sometimes we think of God as a loving God and forget the fact that He is also a just God. Why is it so important to hold those two things together? Well, we might imagine that those those two attributes of God, if you like, His, his love and His justice— uh, might not sit well together and might even uh, contradict each other or cancel each other out in some circumstances. But that is a rather narrow view of love, and it's a rather narrow view of justice. The fact of the matter is, if God could look on a world where so much evil takes place, evil that harms his creation and damages his creatures, if he could look on unmoved, we must say that he is an unloving God. But the fact that he is determined to address sin and evil, ultimately it coheres with the fact that he is a loving God who cares for his creation profoundly and who loves deeply the people he has made. Well, we're going to continue to look at that today from the book of 1 John. We're going to be in chapter 4 as we begin our message. Here is Jonathan. The Beatles once famously declared that all you need is love. (laughs) Now, that's maybe not quite true. Try telling that to your bank if you're late on a payment one day, or try telling that to your prof if you fail to hand in a paper. Love may not be all we need in every occasion, but it's pretty important nonetheless. Each of us needs opportunities to love others, and we all desperately, of course, need to be loved. Children need to know that their parents love them. Parents hope that their children will love them in return. Husbands and wives need to know that their spouse loves them in a different way. We all need to know that our friends love us and care for us. And so whatever kind of front of self-sufficiency we may put on, love is deeply important to each and every one of us. And I'd like to suggest this morning that no love is more important to us than the love of God himself. Beyond the love of a parent or the love of a friend is the significance of the love of God. Nothing matters more to us than to know that the God of heaven loves us, that in his character, the God who made us is indeed a God of love. So that's our great theme this morning, the love of God. And we begin with this simple but far-reaching affirmation of the Scriptures that God is love. That's our first point, plain and simple. God is love. Karl Barth is perhaps the most famous theologian of the 20th century and one of the most prolific theological writers. His perspective was perhaps a little different from ours, but he was undoubtedly a very brilliant man. In 1962, on a visit to the United States from his native Switzerland, he was asked how he might summarize all the millions of words of theology that he had written over uh, the course of his career. And his answer was very intriguing, and it was simply this, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. That's the first truth about God that many of us learn. And it turns out in the end to be the supreme truth, according to Karl Barth. I have a pretty good collection of books in my study at home on the theme of Christian doctrine. Most of them have fairly obvious and pretty unexciting titles, systematic theology, Christian doctrine, etc., etc. But the most intriguing title of all is the title of a volume I bought just a few years ago. It's a big summary of Christian doctrine like the rest. It is a weighty tome of systematic theology, but it has the following very simple title, God is Love. For this particular author, all the theology of the Bible, when summarized in great volumes of Christian learning, it all points to this great and this simple truth, a truth that any child can grasp, at least on some level, the truth that our God is himself the essence of love, the source of love, the definition of love, the purest expression 
of love itself. One of the great chapters on love in the Bible is the chapter we read from at the beginning, 1 John chapter 4. And in those few verses from which we read, John tells us twice that God is Himself love. Verse 8, whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. Verse 16, again, God is love. Our culture speaks quite a lot about love, talks quite a lot about love in film and literature and music and media. We talk about love as a culture all the time, but we don't exactly excel as a people at loving one another well. In the realm of romantic love, which is normally, of course, the focus, our culture trumpets great claims of love and sings great songs of love, but the carnage all around us of broken hearts and broken relationships, broken marriages, broken families, broken homes, it tells us that we're not getting this thing right. I did a quick search to find the top love songs of all time, and near the top of any list is Whitney Houston's I Will Always Love You. A little dated now, but still widely played. Well, in any case, I then looked at the lyrics out of interest and saw something that I'd never noticed before. I saw that this is actually a song about someone leaving the one they say they love. Listen to how this goes. I think I will read this for you rather than sing it, if that's okay. (laughs) But here's, uh, here's Whitney Houston. If I should stay, I would only be in your way, so I'll go, but I know I'll think of you every step of the way. And then comes that endlessly repeated line, and I will always love you, I will always love you, and and on and on it goes. And as I thought about that, I thought how ironic that was, how very, very ironic. Our culture's best product, supposedly, on the theme of love, is actually all about leaving and abandoning the one you love. But of course, actually, that's just what happens, isn't it? That's actually a faithful reflection of love in our world, fickle and changeable, uncertain and unstable. And the hard reality is that we don't really know what love is. The hard reality is that we don't have a good understanding of love, and we're not very good at loving one another. But against that backdrop, the Bible tells us that our God is Himself love, the true definition, the essence, and the source of love. As we think about God's love, we need to recognize that His loving character is, of course, all wrapped up in His eternal being. God always was the God of love before ever He made us, and He would remain the God of love whether or not He ever did make us. Whether or not He had us to love, He remains, He is the God of love. And here, of course, it's important for us to remember that our God is the triune God, one God in three persons. Now, I mentioned the Trinity at this point because at a few points in the Bible, particularly in John's gospel, we're given insight into the fact that the love of God is expressed within the Trinity itself, among the persons of the Godhead. So, for instance, John chapter 3 and verse 35, the Father loves the Son and has placed everything into His hands. Or John chapter 14 and verse 31, Jesus says, but the world must learn that I love the Father and that I do exactly what my Father has commanded me. And we could continue on and find more verses like that. But this is a really important truth for us to think about and to understand. If God has a perfect experience of love within the Trinity, within the relationships of the Trinity in eternity, it means that when He loves, He loves out of the fullness of His own perfect love. You see, God doesn't come to us hungry for love. He doesn't come to us needing love. Yes, He calls us to love Him, but He doesn't do so out of a place of need. He he doesn't approach us in love. He doesn't come to us in love because He needs to get something back. But that's what we do so often, isn't it? We, We love, but we so need to be loved in return, we can often love in a very selfish kind of a way. But not so with God. God loves simply because He is love. He loves out of the fullness of His eternal love. Our God is the triune God who loves perfectly and is loved perfectly in all eternity. And so His love, it is perfect, it is complete, it is infinite. 
And so the psalmist can say in Psalm 36, your love, O Lord, reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the skies. In psalm after psalm after psalm, we read this refrain, that the Lord is good and His love endures forever. One writer I read this week said this, God's love is as infinite as His being. A fish could sooner drink the Mississippi River dry than we could empty the fountain of His love. God is infinitely loving. But as we say that and as we affirm it, and it's true, we need to recognize that the love of God may not be the kind of love that we imagine or expect. After all, you and I, we can tend to sentimentalize love and we can sentimentalize the love of God in particular, and we can do so to the point at which God's love has no meaning left in it at all. We said earlier that we struggle really to understand what love is, to know what love is. We're confused about it in our culture, and we need to recognize that the version of love marketed by Hallmark leading up to the 14th of February, it is not the final word on love flowers and chocolate and overpriced dinner packages. They may all have their place. Overlook them at your peril. (laughs) But I think that we know there is more to love than that. You're listening to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths and a message called The Loving God, part of our series, Who is Like Our God? And if you ever miss a broadcast in the series, you can come and listen online. Our website is EncounterTheTruth.org. You can also listen if you have the Encounter the Truth app. That's free. You're going to find that at your app store. That's a great way to stay connected with and listening to Jonathan's teaching when you're on the go. But whether you listen on the app, online, or through the radio, it is all made possible through your generosity. So thank you for giving to and supporting this ministry. And as you give a gift of any amount this month, we want to send you a book that Jonathan has picked out called Key Bible Concepts. You know, think about the medical industry. When you understand the terminology of that, you're going to have a much better understanding of how medicine works. Same is true in technology and other fields. Well, the same is true with the Bible. When we understand the meaning of words like justification, sanctification, reconciliation, and others, it'll give us a better understanding of God's Word and what the Christian life looks like. We'd love to send you a copy of this book, Key Bible Concepts, is our way of saying thank you for your financial support this month. You can find out more or give online at EncounterTheTruth.org or call us at 1-833-99-TRUTH. That's 1-833-998-7884. Or again, the website is EncounterTheTruth.org. Back to the message. Here is Jonathan. Theologian A.W. Pink laments our superficial sentimentality when we think about the love of God. He writes that there are many today who talk about the love of God who are total strangers to the God of love. The divine love is commonly regarded as a species of amiable weakness, a sort of good-natured indulgence. It is reduced to a mere sickly sentiment patterned after human emotion. Well, I think we recognize the danger that he's talking about there. It is easy for us to imagine that God's love does look like amiable weakness and good-natured indulgence, an unreserved affirmation for us in all that we do, an unquestioning acceptance of us no matter how we behave. We might well like to believe that God's love is like that. But that's simply not the presentation that the Scriptures give us. No, not at all. According to the Bible, God's love is far-reaching. It is comprehensive. It is pure, and it is good. It is entirely consistent with all His other attributes that we've been thinking about together. It is entirely consistent with all that He is. And so the Bible tells us that the Lord loves what is good, what will be good for His creatures, what will be good for His world. Psalm 11 in verse 7, for the Lord is righteous, He loves justice. Psalm 33 in verse 5, the Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of His unfailing love. Isaiah 61 in verse 8, for I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and iniquity. 
God's love is true love, pure love, perfect love, love that seeks the best for His creatures, love that, yes, will deal with wrongdoing and pursue the good in perfect justice, love that cares, love that protects, boundless love, perfect love. We can often pit God's love and His justice against each other, supposing that they are contrary to one another. But according to the Bible, they fit entirely perfectly together. The God of love is the God who will not ignore and will not tolerate evil, but must deal with it. Now, there's a whole lot more to explore here, and we're going to explore more of this truth. But I want to just pause at this point and take in what we've seen so far. The Bible tells us that at the heart of the universe, at the foundation of our existence, at the source of all things, is a God who is not malicious or cruel or capricious or unkind, quite the opposite. At the heart and the source of it all is a God who is, in His essence and in His fundamental character, the God of love, the God who is indeed love. Now, whatever else may be true about life in this world, Whatever else may be true of our experience of pain and loss and darkness in this broken world, this basic truth that God is love, it gives us hope that life is livable in this world. It, it tells us that our instinct to search for love, that our basic need for love, our desire to love others, it's not all some dream or some mist or some illusion. No, it is an instinct and a desire that stems from the Creator Himself. Our yearning for love, our hope for love, these things, they're not empty and they're not in vain. No, love finds its source and its definition, its validation, its truth, its end in the God who made us and who loves us. It may be that you came here today feeling hopeless or alone, or dismayed. Perhaps you came here today feeling thoroughly unloved. I hope that's not so. But if it is, I hope that you can see that this basic truth, the truth that our God is love, it changes everything. It gives joy where there is gloom. It restores hope where there is despair. God is love. That's our first point, plain and simple. And the next is this. God has shown us His love. You may have read of the case of Chris Watts, the Colorado man who has confessed to murdering his pregnant wife and two young daughters last summer. You may have seen the reports of those shocking murders a year ago. I was interested to see that now a year on, the media report that Chris is claiming that he really loved his wife and adored his daughters and can't be held fully responsible for what he did. Now, that is an astounding thing to claim on one level. But, you know, on another level, I expect that he may well believe that he did, in fact, love them. You see, it's thoroughly possible for us to think of ourselves as loving people, to claim to love family or friends, but then to act toward them in terribly, horrifically unloving ways. Watts is an extreme example, of course he is, but he illustrates the fact that we human beings are capable of remarkable hypocrisy and self-delusion when it comes to the matter of love. We can see ourselves as loving even when we act in terrible malice. But wonderfully, this is not so with God. The God who is love, whose character the Scripture tells us is of pure love, He is the God who acts toward His people in perfect, consistent, flawless love. God has shown His love to His people throughout history through the provision of material needs, through the defeat of enemies, through sacrifice and offering and atonement for sin. But the supreme proof and the supreme demonstration of the love of God comes not through the harvests of the fields, nor through the victory on the battlefield, nor even through the sacrifice at the temple. It comes at the cross of Calvary. Romans chapter 5 and verse 6. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, 
though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates His own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Here is love, true love, love for enemies, love for those who have taken God's good gifts with one hand and pushed Him away with the other, love for people even like me and even like you. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 9, this is how God showed His love among us. He sent His one and only Son into the world that we might live through Him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Here is love, not that we showed God a little love and He responded then to our love. No, not a bit of it. God, out of the boundless storehouse of His love, out of His infinite heart of love, He sent His Son to be an atoning sacrifice. Literally here, He sent His Son to be a propitiation for our sins. A propitiation is an anger-bearing sacrifice. It is a sacrifice that addresses, deals with, and turns away anger. Now, just think about that for a moment. Who's angry about sin? Well, it's God Himself. And why is God angry about sin? Well, it's because of His love. He loves justice, and He hates wickedness. He hates all that destroys His people and violates His standards of holiness. You see, sin calls forth the anger of God, and that anger, it's not opposed to His love. It's tied to His love. It's consistent with His love. But when you and I are on the one hand the objects of God's love as His creatures, and on the other hand the objects of His anger as sinners, there's a tension there. There is a problem that needs to be resolved. And the cross is the Father's answer to that problem and His solution to that tension. It is His glorious answer. It is His answer of sheer brilliance and of boundless grace. At the cross, the perfect and the sinless Son gave Himself to be the atoning sacrifice, the anger-bearing sacrifice, the propitiation for our sins. And so John can say in the most famous words of all in Scripture, John chapter 3 and verse 16, for God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. I wonder if you know this loving God. I wonder if you know Him personally. I wonder if you've received His love, the love that He poured out at Calvary. If you haven't done that, let me say you can receive the love of God. You can receive it even today. You can know love as you've never known love before. You can know the love of God which welcomes you and accepts you, not glossing over all the wrong that you've done, not affirming you in your sin, oh no, but paying for it in full, addressing it completely. Love that makes you pure and whole and lovely even to the God of love. Maybe you've never really known true love. Maybe you've come from a very hard family situation. Maybe you've lived through a a series of broken and damaged relationships of one kind or another. And maybe the deepest cry of your heart today is simply to know love, simply to be loved. Well, if that's the case, and it may be for a number here, if that's the case for you, The great message of the Bible, the simple message of the Bible is this. God loves you. He loves you deeply. He loves you extravagantly. He loves you so much that He gave for you the most precious thing He had. He gave His one and only Son that you might be reconciled to Him, redeemed and restored. You're listening to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths and a message called The Loving God. Now, we have to pause right here, but we're going to continue this message on our next broadcast, so I hope you'll make it a point to tune in. 
If you can't make it to the radio in time, though, you can always listen to Jonathan's teaching online. You can come to the website, you can download an MP3 for free. You can also stream the broadcast through your computer or mobile device. Again, you can come to the website and listen anytime it's convenient for you. Stop by EncounterTheTruth.org. Well, thanks for listening today. For Jonathan and for our producer, Mark Breda, I'm Steve Hiller, and I hope you'll join us next time.